Hi, I'm Rick Bennett, host of Gospel Tangents. I need your help. Please donate on our website, gospeltangents.com, and click on the Donate button. It can be a one-time donation or a recurring donation. Your donation will help us to create better resources to learn more about Mormon history. So far, it's been a labor of love, but I really need some help getting better equipment, better sound, that sort of thing. So please either commit to a recurring donation or a one-time donation. We'll take any help we can get. Thank you for your help. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Ugo Perego all the way from Italy. This is going to be the first of several conversations. We're going to talk about DNA. You can think of this first episode as DNA 101, as we learn a little bit about DNA science. But we will continue to learn more about this big topic over several episodes. So don't think you're going to learn everything today. In our first episode, we're going to just get an introduction to Dr. Perego, how he learned about DNA, his mission, and that sort of thing. And we'll even tell about an unusual case of twins born to different fathers. Check out our conversation. Well, welcome um, to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm really excited. Um, all the way from Italy, <laughs> Dr. Ugo Pereg. Actually, you should say your name because I don't want to mispronounce it. This is good. Anyway, Ugo Perego. Ugo Perego. Okay. So, um, I'm really excited. You, you, you literally have come all the way from Italy. Um, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to talk to you today. So last year I, uh, I attended a Mormon history conference in which you presented along with uh, Dr. Brian Hales and we talked a little bit about the, um, the DNA test that you, di that you did. And so that was where I was introduced to you. Um, but for those people at home, I've actually told a few people, hey, I'm talk to, talking to Dr. Perego. And they've been like, now, now who's that? <laughs> so could you kind of give us a little introduction to, to the audience who may not be familiar with you? Okay, uh, so you want to know a little bit about my background or what I do. Um, so I'm a native of Italy, of course, and uh, I've been, uh, uh, lived there all my youth. And uh, I came to the States uh, when I was 21. I served a mission in California. And uh, that's when I uh, first learned English. And I'm still on the process, as you can tell. In, uh, it's not <laughs> and, 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 but anyway, so um, after, after my mission there, um, I went to BYU. I came here on the BYU campus. That's where we are today. And um, I did my bachelor, my undergraduate here in health sciences. And uh, also did some other studies in uh, you know, scriptures and seminary teaching. I did other things while I was here. Got married, and my wife is from Missouri. I uh, lived here uh, all my married life up to five years ago. Um, I worked for a, lar a large project, a worldwide project, for 12 years um, after my, uh, my schooling um, we for uh, the Sorenson companies. And uh, my, our objectives were to collect DNA samples and link them to family history and build a, a large database of correlated genealogical and genetic information help people trace their past, their history, connect to others through DNA whenever the paper trails would not be sufficient to, um, to provide those links. As I did, um, as I worked for them during those 12 years, uh, um, a byproduct or of, uh, of that research was uh, uh, a tremendous amount of data that could be used also for population studies, uh, learning more about the origin and relationship of different population, not just individuals, you know, we had such a variety of um, data in, uh, in this database. And so during this time, I had the opportunity to uh, do a PhD. Uh, I did that with the Professor Torroni, which uh, uh, for those that are in the field, uh, he's uh, the first person that used mitochondrial DNA to identify uh, or differentiate a people group of people, populations, in fact, the first group of people that he studied were Native Americans back in the early 90s. And so he was my graduate advisor, my mentor, and um, I did my PhD with him. And uh, I did uh, my PhD dis dissertation on his suggestion. It wasn't the, the actual project that I proposed to him. I had another project to, uh, in mind, but uh, he actually wanted to uh, take the one study that he did uh, when he was a postdoc on Native Americans. Uh, he wanted to do that with using 
more advanced techniques. You know, now about 20 years have elapsed between the time he did the work and the time I was doing my PhD. And so my PhD dissertation was on using uh, this modern, more advanced technique to, the, to trace the origin of Native Americans uh, through DNA. And um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit, you know, like where my studies are. So I had a PhD in, uh, in genetics and biomolecular sciences. That was my PhD dissertation. My, uh, my main field is a lot. Still today, uh, whenever I have a chance, I work on a side project uh, with uh, some of my colleagues at the university, still most of the time on uh, Native American DNA, ancient or modern. Um, we have a few publications out that have made a, a good impact on, the, on in the area of uh, of knowledge of scholarship. That company I worked for, Sorenson Company, was sold to Ancestry.com in 2012. I was uh, um, considered for a job at Ancestry at that time during the move, and they also use all the data that we built to um, sell the products that they're selling today, which is based on the database that we built, you know, the using the database we built as a reference for the, for the new products. And uh, I felt like I wanted to go into teaching. You know, that was no, the area was already teaching biology at a college here in Utah um, as a part-time instructor. And um, I wanted to do that more, more full-time as a, as a, as a full-time job. And at that time, as I was looking and interviewing with different universities, I had a job offer in Rome, Italy, um, to work for uh, seminaries and institute, the church educational uh, program, the church educational system, and uh, so we made the choice to move the whole family back to Rome. For, that was uh, in 2012, and we have been there since then. Um, so I'm the director of the um, campus, the institute campus in Rome, and uh, I also supervise seminaries and institute uh, classes in uh, Central Italy and Malta. So I do a lot of traveling, a lot of teaching locally. It's, it's teaching, but it's not scientific <laughs> teaching. It's a lot of more. Uh, but we do, um, we do other things besides just religion classes. We have nowadays there is a BYU, Idaho, uh, online and Pathway, you know, so we take those, we have those programs there and I'm responsible and involved with those as well. And I still do science. I'm a visiting scientist at the University of Pavia, which is where I got my PhD. So I do lectures there and, uh, and work on projects that have to do with DNA and populations. And, you know, the one that I presented at MHA, MHA uh, last year was also a project in combination with uh, working with this group. Wow. So yeah. sorry, it was kind of long. I don't no, know what you, what you want. I'm married. I have five kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here in Utah this summer teaching a couple of classes here at BYU, and then we go back at the end of summer. And what classes are you teaching here at BYU? I'm teaching first staff for the Book of Mormon. Oh, okay, I, I thought it might be a genetics class or something. Uh, well, I did uh, I did lecture on genetics in my Book of Mormon class yesterday. Oh really? Oh, <laughs> yeah, no way. That was my. But I'm also here, uh, um, I'll be speaking, and I have spoken already at different venues. Uh, I wish I could have come to your class. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll be speaking at the BYU um, genealogy conference, and I will be speaking on DNA stuff. I'll give three lec lectures there. I'll be speaking a fair Mormon. Um, I will be speaking about DNA there as well and evolution. I will uh, speak at BYU Education Week, and uh, there will be all science lectures oh, wow. as well. So, I was planning to go to FAIR, I, except for it always seems like I always have a schedule conflict with that. But yeah, I'll, I'll have to make sure I know when you're speaking, make sure I can come to that. It's so going to be a busy summer. It yeah. is a busy summer. And so then you'll be heading back to Italy in the fall? At the ve no, at the very end of August. Oh, in, in August. The, the, the day after BYU Education Week is over, we're flying back. Oh, wow. So I went to Rome last summer fell in love with Rome. We had so much fun. We actually stayed at a, at a place literally within walking distance of the Vatican. We walked to the Vatican every day as we as we toured all over. It was it was a lot of fun. So probably pretty hot if you went there in the summer. It was a little bit hot. It wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't too bad, but yeah, it was a little hot. Now let me ask you something because I saw something recently on the internet uh, about these these triplets, three girls, mm -hmm. and apparently they submitted their uh, DNA. Uh, to ans I believe it was Ancestry.com. It could have been another website. Yeah, there are different compositions. Uh, and they had different compositions. Um, how, how would that happen? Well, um, there, there are two explanations to that. Number one, no, uh, even, even uh, twins, okay, uh, have uh, identical DNA 
to each other. Even so, you have to consider this: Are you looking at identical twins or a fraternal twins? First of all. Yeah. Well, in this case, what it said was that their DNA matched, but they had different ancestry, which didn't make sense to yeah. me. But so this is this is how you explain it. Okay. So let's take a brother and a sister. Okay, same parents, and um, the brother is tested and the sister is tested and the percentage of their ancestry is different from each other, okay? They're biological. We know that the, in this case, both mom and dad are the same for both of them. How do we explain that? Well, you know, let's assume that I have a, um, that each parents have a deck of cards of 100 cards each, right? Mom has 100 cards and dad has 100 cards. They are all different cards, one to 100, whatever that is. Now the first child come along, and uh, he get to is the combination of 50 cards picked randomly from one deck and 50 cards picked randomly from the other deck, right? You bring them together, you have a new deck of cards that uh, the result is the two previous deck, but it's not 100% each. It's only half of that because you only gave 50% of your DNA to your children. You don't get to choose which 50% is randomly transmitted, okay? Now the other child comes around, the daughter or whatever, the second child, and the same process is repeated. So she picks 100 cards from the first deck and 100 from the, uh, 50 from the second, so 50 from the first deck and 50 from the second deck. The combination of these 100 will be different than that of the brother, right? And in, in so because of that, if I have, for example, some Native American ancestry in my, in my uh, DNA, <coughs> my children may or may not inherit that Native American ancestry from me, but definitely they will inherit it in different percentages, okay? Because I'm not 100% Native American. I might have 20% Native American in my ancestry, so one kid might inherit it 12%, and the other one get 5% or nothing. That's, it's, it's totally random. We say that on average, you have 25% of each of your grandparents' DNA, but you can have as little as zero and as much as 50%. And, uh, and uh, what we're talking about is average because across all the grandparents, grandchildren sets that have been tested, we, we see, uh, you know, like the bell curve, you know, we see a great variety, but it approaches 25% on the average. And, and that happens even within the same family. Okay. okay. Now, if you have identical twins, uh, you have almost 100% of similar DNA. But if you have fraternal twins, it's the same thing as having a brother and a sister. They each get 50%. But there is also a, a proven case of a woman that had twins from two different men. You know, all you have to do is just have, you know, be fertile and uh, having two mature eggs and uh, have sexual relation within a very short amount of time wow. with two different men. And one fertilized one egg and the other one fertilized the other egg. Never heard of that before. It did happen. Wow. It did happen. That's crazy. So the, the woman becomes the, 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 the meaning, you know, the, the vector to to bring to life two brothers from two different men. Wow, it's, it's very unusual, but it, we have a case of that, you know, as well. So they did a paternity test and found out that each two child Two different fathers. No way. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think in this case, if I remember correctly, there was uh, um, quite a difference in the pigmentation of the skin. So there was... Uh, um, two very different ethnic background from uh, the parents, from the fathers, you know, which caused one kid to be quite dark and, and, and one being a li lot lighter. Wow. And, and, and that was like really kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Something <laughs> seems strange. <laughs> yeah. Some suspicion there. Hmm. I hope you enjoyed our discussion with Dr. Ugo Perego. In our next discussion, we'll ask the question, how do you figure out a 150-year-old DNA paternity test? Um, there is a, a, a different approach that you must take genetically to answer the paternity of a son versus the paternity of a daughter 
when it is something that happened 150 years ago. Nowadays, if you suspect that your child is not your child, regardless if it's a girl or a boy, you do a paternity test, you test the mother, the father, and the child, right? And uh, there are certain markers, there are autosomal markers, they're called, um, that uh, are very unique, and uh, the combination of such can only be reproduced within a family. So either somebody is 100% not your child, or it is 99.999999% your child, okay? Uh, which is just a, another way to say 100%, you know, but yeah, DNA is, is as a one notch stronger in excluding relationship than it is to include. Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.